So let me start with the introduction. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Luis Zingales. I'm the faculty director of the Steeler Center and the faculty member here. And we are very excited uh, to all, uh, Anna and Matthew, for a conversation with Guy Romney on finance, technology, and society. Uh, please note that we are on record and live streaming. And so silence your phones and remember whatever you say will be here forever. Um, as usual, the views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stigler Center promotes and disseminates research on regulatory capture and the various distortions that special interest groups impose on capitalism. We have many initiatives, including the Capitalist Podcast, co-hosted by uh, Kate Walker and myself, and the Pro Market Blog, so please check them out if you haven't already. Tomorrow is our last event of the season. We are co-hosting a discussion on the economy and the 2020 election with the Booth uh, Government and Policy Club and the Harris uh, Center for Economic Policy. It will feature Randy Crossman, who is our deputy dean and colleague, and is moderated by uh, one of uh, the journalists in residence of the Steelers Center, uh, Adam Creighton. Back to this afternoon. Uh, we look forward to an insightful conversation with our speaker. So uh, let uh, me introduce them briefly. Anna Admati is a professor of finance and economics at, and the director of the Corporation and Society Initiative at Stanford GSP. She's also a senior fellow at the Stanford, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy and Research. She has written uh, extensively on financial markets, portfolio management, financial contracting, corporate governance, and banking. And she is the co-author of the book, uh, The Banker's New Clothes, What's Wrong with Banking and What to Do About It. And that was named by Time as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, and by Foreign Policy as one of the top 100 global thinkers. So she's both influential and a thinker, which is rare these days. Uh, now, Guy Rowling is a clinical associate professor of strategic management here at Booth. He teaches a class of political economy and regulation and news media, and he has 30 years of experience in financial journalism, business and politics, among others. Uh, for the last few years, his work has focused on the dynamics of regulatory capture, a topic here to the Steeper Center, as you might imagine. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. And I thank you very much for taking the time and doing this uh, Fireside chat. So, before we start, so you've been a professor, a finance professor at Stanford for uh, three uh, decades, and we will discuss your uh, your work and your research. But uh, your personal arc of your career is uh, weaved into your uh, uh, work in the last uh, decade and even uh, more. Uh, you have gone through some. Uh, kind of uh, transformation. So before we go there, I would like to set the stage and give us some uh, context. And if you can tell us something about your how you started your career and what was your uh, uh, focus of your research career, and then we look at what happened in the last two years. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for being here. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Luigi. Um, so I was just a run-of-the-mill uh, finance professor, and that comes after studying math and statistics and finding my way to, uh, to finance through an advisor at, at the age who told me that finance was the most wonderful thing ever. That's part of economics, wonderful stuff. And so I got a job at Stanford, I was lucky enough, and um, got down to publish a parish. And, uh, so I published some papers, and they were um, theory types of papers trying to understand how information gets sold and incorporated in prices, mutual fund performance, uh, market mechanisms. 1987, before some of you were born, um, there was a crash, very uh, uh, sort of point crash, uh, where stock market went down by nine, by you know lots. Uh, on one day, and it was about trading mechanisms, and you remember. Um, 
and what went wrong for soil insurance derivatives, that was those were the days when we started uh, doing that. Then, of course, we did the internet bubble burst. I'm teaching corporate finance. And my research has moved a little bit more into contracting, into venture capital contracts, then uh, finally, so open governance. So uh, a decade ago, actually, in the last 20 years on and off, I wondered about corporate governance. And corporate governance, the way we have it in economics and in law, and especially around here, is sort of thought of as just one problem, one problem alone. And that problem is between the managers of a big corporation with these first shareholders and these first shareholders. How do they govern? That the manager might not do what the shareholders want to do. So how do we make sure the manager creates shareholder value? Do we give stock compensation, uh, off the, uh, stock or options or something like that? And what would happen? And how does, you know, a little bit of how the boards work, things like that. So that was sort of the, the last right. traditional thing. And I then uh, in September 2008, uh, Lehman Brothers collapses, and then the rest of the financial system is being is bailed out. And that uh, is the inciting incident that uh, shook you, yeah. and you're starting to look at the world a little bit different. So tell us this uh, process that you're going through. So, I mean, obviously, 2007 was sort of rumbling in the financial sector, but, you know, for a finance academic, it's kind of around the cooler, around the lunch table, what's happening with their terms, what just happened there uh, with, uh, you know, in Europe and these, all these uh, little signs that something was subprime, was sort of, you know, the correction in housing and you know, the fall, what's going on. So, you know, that was sort of the warm up. And then, of course, big implosion, you know, we're things we're told, you know, that it's okay, but people in finance certainly were getting very nervous in, in 2007 and leading into 2008 and into the summer of 2008. September, you mentioned, was like this big earthquake. You know, if you now listen to the participants who were at these positions, you know, there was a big earthquake, a hundred year flood, something that was happening and the system really came to near implosion. So that's the big crisis, the big shock. And after that, everything changed for a lot of people. For the people who were at the controls of this system, they basically um, decided to save it, because otherwise it would be even worse. And they were thinking of the Great Depression and other events that in history where, you know, the system froze for a while, the recession was really bad, so they were trying to stimulate and throw money at it, basically, from central banks and the governments. So that was that. For me, it was like, what just happened? I thought the financial system was just good. And so what went wrong? And, you know, colleagues of mine who were more in banking were coming on the news and why, you know, hanging out, there was a debate and petitions about should we bail out or not, TAR was the bailout program of the government, you know, they're voting it down, do we advocate We're in the news, you know, not just like the plumbing of, of the economy somehow with wonderful venture capital and stock markets and options and all hedging and all the great stuff we teach. So I started looking and um, it was quite an experience. I sometimes describe it as falling in a rabbit hole. You know, there were all kinds of strange things I was reading and questions I was asking, and I just didn't like the answer. I didn't understand. Uh, and I kept asking, and I kept looking, and then I started questioning a lot of things. Yeah. So you, uh, the, the first thing you you dedicated a lot of your research and the question you raised into the questions of the leverage in the financial yes. system. And you came up with some conclusions that I want you to share. This is your book that focuses a lot on that. Uh, for full disclosure, I wrote the preface on one of the editions. But uh, so this this was the, the, this was the first uh, few uh, a few years, and then it takes another another direction. But let's start with the leverage piece. 
So basically, my first question uh, right off the bat was, wait a minute, I teach corporate finance in corporate finance class, which I would assume you all kind of have to take, uh, have to take. Uh, you learn about uh, debt and equity and how corporations fund. Usually, we make it out of that to be special and different and all of that. And, uh, and so the gold standard, before you start getting into bankruptcy costs and the taxes and all these other trade-offs we discussed, um, is uh, you invest your own money, you bear the, the risk, and that's kind of the all equity firm doesn't have as many as many problems, although it might pay more taxes. So we talked about that. I asked, how come the banks have virtually no equity? How come they live on yeah. Remind us the numbers before the financial crisis. What kind of well, letters the requirements, we yeah. the requirements are under a regulation that actually was not fully implemented in the U.S. International standards called Basel II coming into the crisis was the banks need to have something like two percent, and it wasn't even equity. And there were two measurement issues relative not to the total assets, but something called risk weighted assets, which is a weighted effort of the assets. Because some assets are just ignored for their sake, some assets get a half, quarter, all kinds of. So basically, some assets zero. like Greek bonds are deemed as yeah. the So the AAA is fully safe, uh, AAA rated, Greek government debt fully safe, uh, you know, no, no <coughs> chance of recovery losses from those, even though banks pay only safe asset. So there was just all the details, but it's like the, the headline numbers were so ridiculous. It's like, what is going on? And every time you'd encounter equities expensive, you'd say, wait a minute, but that's just a purely private cost. Expensive is when, you know, I can't, if you forbid me from robbing you, it's expensive for me, you know, that I can't rob you. I prefer to rob you. So, you know, that's privately possible for me to have a law against robbery if I can steal somebody's money. But that's not a social cost, because that's just a transfer of your money to me. So to say, oh, you know, if you if you change this regulation, I'll pay more taxes, that taxes have to be paid by somebody. We can settle that. The, the, the amount of tax doesn't have to be paying your debt. That's a crazy law anyway. We never have a justification for that anyway. But for Max? To encourage them to give them a subsidy when they are dangerous, that made no sense to me. And then, of course, there are all the safety nets of banks, which also what makes them special. So every time I heard the words that banks are special and different, my conclusion was they're special in getting away with what they get away with. That was the specialness, and I couldn't quite hear any other answer than that. Was a year of battling on op-ed pages and trying to chase what was happening, which I heard from within the system was going to be a disaster, which is sort of this non-reform reform. Um, organizing petitions, uh, op-eds, and upon op-eds a whole year until a year and a half of writing this book, which is basically a, a very accessible um, book, including to you know politicians, staffers of politicians, uh, media people who I encountered along the way, who I couldn't send to the two hundred dollar corporate finance textbook to really understand even the beginning, and I'd spend all my time touring them, which was time consuming and not again not efficient. Anyway, so I wrote this book, and a few more years of battling over these rules, going to conferences, writing more comment letters, more op-eds, and I sort of went back to where I was before the crisis. I mean, I kept in touch with that debate, but it does get a bit tiring to, you know, write the same thing in every form and every length and to every audience. Uh, so I did that a lot, and I still do a little bit. But coming back to the governance question, I realized I was looking under one week less right, but the problem was completely elsewhere. And I started questioning a lot of the assumptions behind the fact that the only problem we have to worry about is between shareholders okay. and managers. So we'll get to that uh, soon, but just to uh, wrap this part. So you are calling for more equity, less leverage. Uh, you show that banks are the more dangerous than we think, and we're actually subsidizing them uh, implicitly to the tune of, I don't know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. We don't really know the, uh, uh, the numbers. And then, in this process, you start learning about 
politics. Yes. And when I say politics, I don't mean only politics in DC, but the politics of finance. Yes. So can you take us through that process? So the bankers no close, uh, so the first piece we wrote, uh, myself and three other <coughs> colleagues on this, we wrote this manifesto 2010, uh, they had three pieces, policies, irrelevant facts, and myths okay. in the discussion, etc. Federal white bank equity is not the really So there were a lot of nonsense people were saying. The myths part was the, uh, the academic stories. And the academic stories are, are sort of a set of uh, narratives, uh, models, so assumptions, really, that kind of reverse engineer what we see as you know, this is the way it's got to be, this is the way it's good, invents various trade-offs that are not really there when you look at it. So for so these models, uh, and for the, and, and then the people who choose these models where, you know, they might conclude that, you know, opacity is wonderful and it's just, uh, you know, liquidity problem, it's only in the plumbing, all these other narratives that were, that were chosen, uh, there could be huge elephants in the room and it's just not in the model. And then it would make up some something, maybe you see it, maybe you don't, where it's had that whole story <coughs> around it. So in that process, I learned that people not only do what they get away with, but also say what they get away with. And it goes all the way to confusing their audience about what's really going on. And getting away with that, because the language is confusing, the jargon is confusing. And so that's where you get into, you know, 31 flawed claims and counting and, you know, one by one different things. Okay. So, and so there's a politics in that because it's about what people know, it's about what people want to know, and it's about what people get away with saying to justify something they want. So the way you describe it, uh, I want to focus in more, is it, it, you, you wrote that paper called It Takes a Village. And the way you describe it actually is look at those harms, look at the deception, look at those fraud, but do not focus, in the case of the financial system or financial crisis, don't focus on the bankers, focus on the enablers. And then you're starting to miss the enablers that actually are important part of the system. And you use this uh, metaphor of it takes a village from the uh, spotlight uh, movie uh, about pedophilia in the church. So this is pretty harsh words. So what happened was I was asked to write a chapter, and this would be nothing I could do in my previous self, for a book on justice by a philosopher. And I decided to take the opportunity to kind of reflect on my own experiences. So why is it that I actually you know, failed? And it's, 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 I don't know if I'm failed, all everything's relative to expectations. You know, I was influential but not powerful. And it's an important distinction because it's really about power in the end, uh, what I learned, which before was not a word I would really you know, use so much. But anyway, so at the time, two movies came out, 2016, The Big Short and, and Spotlight. Spotlight uh, was obviously about the media. I applaud you for having a program for the media because the media is super important. And it was the media that went to the root of that problem in that case. And the question is, who actually unpacks what people say and all the narrative and all the hype and all the PR, you know, who is able to explain what's really going on. In this paper, it takes a village to maintain a dangerous financial system, I went through the enabler. And I don't get as excited about the enablers, about the actual actors in the private sectors, and there's a whole ecosystem of those. There are people who work for the banks, for the credit rating agencies, for the auditors, for uh, all, all these consultants, you know, all of that. And of course, the media also can be, you know, private sector, you know, media owned by some corporation. And then you get to the people who, so those are, they're, do, they're doing what they teach them in business school to do, you know, what they think their duty is to the shareholders, whatever. Where it gets more difficult is when it gets to the people who claim or who are supposed to actually do policy for the public or comment on that, including the academics, and you hear them either stand by or even worse. And that really is difficult. 
that was difficult. That's when I started reading, and I became completely out of my sight, so far off, because I already was reading political science to understand what I was experiencing. Political science and law, exactly what the laws are that enable this or that. And then, literally, soft subject, psychology, sociology. I was reading a book called Moral Disengagement, how good people can do harm and feel good about themselves. Because to explain to myself what was going on. So So you start with finance, you move to uh, a pop a, a regulation, and then you start to look into regulatory capture and you say, you know what, regulatory capture lives in this world where actually there might be media capture by uh, various means, and then academic capture, and academic capture is very uncomfortable because actually what you're saying is finest professors capture. We see academics uh, in other fields, you know, support the sugar industry with, with studies of nutrition or, or you know, all kinds of uh, um, paid content uh, or, or spending by or taking money, so it's not it's not unique. And uh, you know, people are different. What I what I am most disturbed with is when people don't engage or people just keep saying things that are that are really flawed. And so the field has. I got friends. I got people who don't talk to me. You know. So. <laughs> Okay, can you elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> because I see that people are eating. Not with uh, the cameras and okay. glass of wine. Okay. <laughs> All right, this is not allowed here at least at one point this time. Okay, so uh, so let's go back to this uh, tunnel vision that you uh, uh, described. So I looked at your uh, last uh, uh, paper before the financial crisis. Uh, the Wall Street uh, uh, 2000, this is a paper Probably that you published 2009. in 2009. And you've been working it since 2007. The Wall Street Walk and shareholder activism, exit of the form of the of the of the voice. We examine whether a large shareholder can alleviate, uh, alleviate conflicts of interest between managers and shareholders through the credible threat of exit on the basis of private information, so on and so forth. So, in retrospect, what you are uh, what you actually been telling uh, uh, me, and I heard you in the previous. Uh, lectures and talks that you look back at the, these amazing nice models uh, very impressive uh, models and a lot of papers that you were able to publish and now you feel that uh, this is all fantastic but maybe it was a bit of a inefficient use of your intellectual uh, energy because actually this conflict between shareholders and executives, which is the, the principal agent problem, as we call it, is, is it, it's an important story, but it's such a tiny sliver of really what's happening out there, not only in the financial world, not only in the banking world, but if we want to understand economics. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, it comes now that I, uh, I mean, I, I still have theory papers, but much further you're between right now. I wrote one to understand the economics of heavy indebtedness by corporations and the addictiveness part of, of, of that. And that is more about the conflict of interest between creditors and shareholders. Uh, and, and, and that helped me understand some of what, what was going on. But for example, I became intellectually more interested in in much more basic governance problems, including how to hold corporations to any law at all, just how to enforce laws on corporations. And that's sort of this question why nobody goes to jail, which I thought was kind of trivial, but it's not. It's a question of whatever rule you have, call it a law, call it a regulation, how do you make the corporation comply? And that's before we even talk about who writes those rules and all of that. So just the enforcement problem per se is not trivial. So for example, how do you detect that a, a rule was broken by a corporation? You need a whistleblower, basically. I mean, think of Wells Fargo and sort of think of conduct. So I started going to much more basic problems. Okay, you know, can you trust the corporation? To uh, you know, to, to treat you fairly, you know, what what about conduct, all of that? How can you make sure they abide they're by accounting rules, by whatever rules? And I've started encountering these issues. A whistleblower from Deutsche Bank who doesn't even get a phone call back from the SEC, 
that is so abstract, the public is not going to understand even the violation. In Wells Fargo, the public did, because it was about opening accounts and cheating people and selling them, you know, insurance they didn't need, stuff like that, or cheating them on, on exchange rate or whatever. But there was so much else going on, and then whoever would even talk about it. So how much do we not know of what's going on uh, under the corporate sort of veil behind that, that veil? So in thinking about whistleblower and whistleblower policy, how do you, you know, I, I go back almost to the original papers I wrote, which is, you know, paying for information. Except here it's in the context of, you know, are you going to give them part of the settlement? Are you going to, how are you going to get people to tell you bad things? You need to rely on short sellers, investigative reporters. How do you get information that a corporation or any institution doesn't want you to know? Now we get to the media. So that's why I've acquired this this, this one thing. But when I thought of whistleblowers, I could have, in my own self, I would have gone for at six months you know, into my office, close the doors, and written a mathematical model. And I didn't do that. So I, I felt again that it wasn't clear what my model would be usually say, it depends on this parameter or that parameter, and you know, you, you need to make it easier to, to, to say, and maybe anonymize it under this condition and that condition. I kind of knew it intuitively. Eventually, I submitted a comment letter uh, with the director of my Corporation Society Initiative, uh, to the SEC about their details of their whistleblower policy that they have after Dodd Frank to kind of encourage whistleblowers to speak up. And we know that Lehman and Ron, all of these, uh, had whistleblowers for and or Theranos, most recently to the private company, had whistleblowers that actually told you something. Yeah, me. so you reminded the uh Deutsche Bank. So actually, two years ago, uh, we had here at the Stigler Center uh, the Eric Ben Arzi, the quant that uh, yeah. find actually what he found is that uh, Deutsche Bank was has misrepresented the, yeah. its asset by <coughs> the tune of twelve billion dollars. And here in this uh, in this uh, uh, room, we had him in a in a video conference, he said that he think that the corporate governance in Deutsche Bank is totally favored. And he believed that Deutsche Bank was able to uh, capture a regulator, and he think that the bank will continue to deteriorate until two years ago, and now Deutsche Bank is already oh, yeah. a zombie bank. So oh, yeah. that was a whistleblower that had some uh, insights. So so when I, when, I, when I was prepping for this conversation, I asked you, so, to look at this paper from 2009, and I asked you, so when it came to politics, if I look at the, those papers that you wrote in the uh, first 20 years of the career before the financial uh, uh, crisis, and how did you deal with politics? And you surprised me, you said it was very easy. I had zero uh, politics in my financial, in my, in, my, in my papers, and the question to you is, can you be uh, a very successful academic in finance uh, and describe a world that is uh, devoid from any uh, politics, regulation, and the rules of the game in many ways? Oh yeah, that, that's actually the formula for success. Um, <laughs> avoid it, anything about it, or have at the end of your paper a little, you know, if it's relevant in some sectors, it is more, you know, Empirical prediction sort of what they like the most, uh, uh, but policy prescriptions, you know, that, that helps with the editors. And it doesn't mean that anybody really is serious about that. It's, it's just a, like a ritual thing you do. And sometimes you'd go between the beginning and the end of the paper, and the body of the paper has really nothing to do with it, but it's very fancy. And, um, and so at the end you say, well, you know, I think that you know, capital should be taxed or something, and you can't even explain what that word means. And but you know, it sounds good. So uh, Luigi uh, has a book, uh, a chapter, I believe he wrote it something six or seven uh, uh, years ago that shows some evidence that uh, you talk about success in career that for a finance professor to be a pro-business or pro-CEOs is uh, beneficial to the career. Is this still the case? You might not see it. It's a very subtle stuff. But you know, we have, for example, um, 
you know, there are prizes in journals and conferences to their sponsors and all of that. So, you know, for, for, for winning a, a, I mean, I mean even, even a year, you know, Goldman Sachs was, was sponsoring a book award in Financial Times. I mean, my book had any chance? Uh, not that year. Later it was McKinsey. Maybe I would have had a chance that year. But in any case, um, so, you know, certain papers, if they feel threatening, uh, they probably, but it's all hard to tell because in, in the academia it's all very fuzzy gray area. So there's not, but nobody's going to go to jail for anything of this sort. It's all judgmental. So it's very, very subtle. Okay, so I want to look at another quote of yours and maybe just a little deeper. These, uh, uh, the experiences that we just described have led me to re-examine the standard view of corporate governance that focuses on shareholder value uh, creation as the desired goal. So actually what you're now advocating more and more, and you're not doing it only uh, you know, as a pundit, as an academic, and also as a professor, you said, you know, if we focus on shareholder creation, we might be missing a lot. But the problem is that once we want to look at other issues, that it gets very, very complicated, muddy, and very difficult to come up with really clear recommendations. So, 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 can you decide how you do that? Yes. So, I people who question shareholder value talk about other stakeholders, stakeholder theories, all of that. I'm actually not advocating that. Shareholder value. We were told by you know the fathers of capitalism that that uh, you know corporations and when we assume it in basic microeconomics corporations you know maximize profit or call it you know stock price or whatever you know you actually make it to be the objective and importantly it said that if they do that then that is like their social responsibility as Milton Friedman says that that would lead to the most efficient outcome the invisible hand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, there rests under these assumptions. So the assumptions are that the rest of the people dealing with the corporation, namely the employees, the creditors, the suppliers, the public at large, are protected by a combination of contract, competition, and laws. So for that, you need the political system to work to, you know enforce these complicated contracts that protect everybody from any from, from harm because they could compete would go walk elsewhere if, if it doesn't. Uh, and if there's a you know pollution or some other harm you would look to the government uh, or any other friction. Um, and and you just get the government or somebody to uh, or maybe it arises in nature to have competition and we're good. The problem is these assumptions are wrong. So what we need to do is focus partly on that. Why is it that, uh, and, and we talked about two sectors in the title of this talk, that there are enormous distortions in the financial sector and now in some of the parts of the tech industry. Uh, and the government seems unwilling or incapable of making it so that shareholder value maximization be okay. That's the question. So, I, I want to try to push back into the devil's advocate or the people who push back on, on you. So you talk a lot about the deception and uh, and uh, and fraud and opacity, and some someone might argue, you know, what that's all uh, that's all true, and we have some evidence of that. But actually, this is what we call this is friction. Okay, this is part of the friction. If you want a financial system, you'll always have fraud. You'll always have uh, this. And do you have an? an but the but but. Looking at the net effect, we have a, a great financial system and capitalism works. What kind of evidence can you can produce and says, you know, actually, you know, we have a root problem here. This is not just friction. And if the financial system, later we move to other systems, technology and so on, is 9% of GDP, most of it still is efficient allocation of resources and real uh, beneficial uh, uh, services to the economy. Do you have any, any evidence that it's just not, not just friction and we should something much more fundamental is happening here? Okay, on the, on the fraud, I mean, again, you look at a situation in which 
uh, you know, people can trust what they're sold or, or told. And you ask yourself, you know, so what's the harm? Well, we can discuss, you know, whether that erodes uh, some 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 of the markets. This sort of extraction of, of uh, you know, taking advantage of people in the context of the kinds of things I was talking about. The, I don't need fancy stuff. I can look at simple stuff. To me, the uh, the behavior of the banks, of the large banks in particular, is itself indicative that something is really wrong with them. You don't find corporations that hate equity and are so hated by investors as the large banks out of banking. So this hate of equity investors and the love of debt, and especially passive depositors like all of us are for the banks, is itself a symptom of having too little bit because we see a lot of, casually, we see a lot of corporations that live perfectly fine and they reinvest their earnings all the time. This rush to take money out, this behavior of the banks where with almost no equity, they still don't ever default. They just keep rolling, 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 essentially showing every symptom in the book of zombies, of insolvent corporations, yet they can persist, suggests that they don't live in any market at all that the only way they can survive is because they have this safety net that allows them to remain insolvent and yet not default. And therefore, we don't see it until the whole system implodes, basically. So there is plenty of casual evidence that something is very, very wrong in, in finance. And so again, the fact that you want to, as a Jamie Dimon, uh, to become big and dominant, and you can do it, it doesn't make it efficient. If they could live in markets, we might see them break up the way conglomerates did in the 80s, because these are just really unfathomably large corporations. I mean, we don't even, when they say big, I mean, you don't even appreciate how big they are. When they say Amazon or, or Facebook or Apple are the largest, they only mean by equity size. By asset size, only financial institutions are the largest. We're talking trillions of dollars, and you know, thousand dollars bill stacked on top of one another, 68 miles high, that's one trillion, okay? A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. So this is how big those numbers are. And JP Morgan Chase has two and a half trillion by accounting standards in the U.S., almost four by accounting standards in Europe. And that's without lack of balance exposure. But Europe is not doing uh, much better when it comes to oh, financial okay. regulation, right? Europe is doing worse. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, that's, you know, that's a bit so, so Europe Africa, is very sick on the finance. They never recovered. Yeah, so one, uh, one person the recovered. reason I'm asking about regulation, because when we move to tech, I'd like yeah. to uh, draw this uh, comparison. Yeah. Uh, draw this comparison. Okay. We haven't uh, 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 talked about, so one of the assumptions in all those uh, uh, models, of course, is competition. Yeah. And uh, do you agree with this growing body of uh, uh, literature that has been discussed here in, uh, in uh, many of our events here at the Stigler Center that actually we have much less competition than we uh, tended to think we have? Do you see it also in the financial uh, system? Well, uh, I'm not a competition person and competition in finance is, is complicated because there have been there's always a concern that if you, that competition is, a, is sort of, in finance, is competition for recklessness. So you kind of have always these, these narrative about how, you know, competition is not good for stability uh, of, of the system. So there's tension about, about this. Clearly though, uh, the, the institutions that singularly, by themselves, are so important there's no way we can ever imagine realistically that they would be allowed to fail. <coughs> have a lot of power. And so you don't see disruptions in finance, despite all the talk of uh, you know, FinTech and, and crypto and all of that. Because just like in other sectors where the dominant uh, firms can sort of have a kill zone and can buy everybody, uh, they buy off their competitors. So if you have any, anything useful uh, technologically in finance, they, they you know, JP Morgan JP can buy. Okay, so it moves us actually, it's a good segue to move to the uh, technology uh, world, specifically to the digital uh, uh, platforms. And recently you started uh, uh, teaching a class 
for the first time in your uh, uh, career because all of a sudden you find a lot of similarities between what you've seen in the last 10 years in the financial system to what you see now in the debate on the large, what we call here, the digital uh, platforms. Yeah, so, so sort of back at Stanford, I still keep my day job, so got to you know, teach, but uh, I stopped teaching corporate finance and I was actually asked to develop a course related to uh, this battle once I was, you know, emerged from writing the book. So starting about 2014, uh, I developed a course, course called Finance and Society, which was very interdisciplinary. It basically, took, for MBA students, it was taking them into the politics of finance, the politics of central banks, the media, uh, all of that, bringing in, you know, management, uh, the endowment of Stanford, the hedge funds, uh, policy makers, uh, reporters, central bankers, like that. And uh, immediately after that, was allowed to develop a course for undergraduates at Stanford because one of the things I didn't mention in terms of distortions and frictions and all of that is the friction of, of, of savviness of consumers. So people who don't want regulation are saying, well, it's the fault of these borrowers. They, you know, this, this woman sitting in the bathtub was taking five mortgages in the big short. You know, so too bad, you know, they over borrowed, uh, they can't pay now, you know, too bad for them you know, payday lending, all kinds of things like that. So I thought, well, uh, obviously, even Stanford students, undergrads who might not go into finance are not savvy enough. And nowadays in the financialized world, they'll have to, you know, bo they might be already borrowing student loans, their, you know, car loans, mortgages, do they understand uh, the small print of things, the fiduciary, for investment managers, um, saving for retirements, which not everybody does on their own. Can they, and then can they read the newspaper and understand what people are talking about? What's Dodd-Frank, what's to make the free banks, break them up, what, are all, what is Bernie Sanders talking about, Elizabeth Warren, when they talk about this. So I developed the Financial Society course for undergraduates, which has listings in political science, and economics, public policy, others. By now it's gone to be a big course. But I still had a finance label. My MBA finance class was listed under finance, which most of the people who look under electives for finance don't want to hear about the politics of finance. Which one year I called it that, politics of finance, and that's when I got the least number of students. Um, <laughs> dirty word. Uh, so now I call it finance and society. It still sounds, you know, do goody and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not a You should call it the future of finance. Right. No, so I should call it is finance broken, which is what I call the internet course recently. Being savvier about marketing, a very important thing in the school. Um, so basically starting to read the newspapers, now being quite connected to the real world and thinking economics and politics uh, is much more important than my colleagues uh, think it is. Um, Obviously, the tech sector and platforms and Facebook and Google became much more newsy in a bad way, and not just you know hailed as, uh, as the next best thing. And so uh, I had an opportunity to teach actually a course with uh, uh, a person who was a co-producer of this HBO series, Silicon Valley, really not an economy, so that's like you couldn't imagine me teaching a course with it. Uh, Jonathan Dutton uh, before, but that was the experience that just emerged from. It was a compressed course. Uh, for two weeks we have these courses that are, uh, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three hours each, it's just a half course in, uh, in two weeks. And it was very intense, but I got, I got out of finance to immerse in another sector and see the similarities and differences between uh, you know, that important sector where it's about other people's money and intermediation and sort of the other people's data and data intermediation that is sort of the, the So the tell us, what are the similarities and differences between Jamie Dimon and Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> <laughs> well, they all, uh, they're both powerful and have uh, friends in high places. Um, Who's and, more powerful? Uh, rich. Politically? Um, well, I mean, they, they, there are differences and similarities. I think finance and, 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 and data, you know, data platforms uh, are both sort of um, sectors where it, it's pretty abstract stuff in the end. So it's it's not like other sectors that where you, can, you it's hard to touch the, the sort of problems or the harm. It's all about 
you know, what people know and what people know about you, the, your privacy, you know, it's about data <coughs> management and, and it's about, it's sort of more in the media and communication sector in data. And in finance, it's, it's really about sort of moving the money around. And so, the, in banking, you know, I, I can go point by point, but it might get tedious. I mean, they, they both uh, are not functioning as well as one would like. Yeah. In both of them, they are basically, the, in, in finance, in, in both of them, there are steps one can take. I'm not an uh, the internet expert as much as to know what the silver bullets are, and I think it's more, it, to my mind, but that's maybe because I don't know enough, it's a little more complicated there because things like privacy and speech are really complicated. I mean, to sort of say who will police them or how to con control them and, and, and all the bargains. I do think there are a few uh, obvious things to do there. In banking, I think that, that um, it's a sector that we have always regulated because it was about money and the government has a lot to do with the currency and central bank, so it has its own complications yeah, so that way. But we, the point, the point is that we, we created a privileged sector, a privileged sector, in the case of internet, unregulated sector, in the case of finance, poorly regulated sector. So you kind of have in one case a lot of regulation, a whole ecosystem of regulation that are both complex and ineffective at the same time. And in the internet, you're just grappling, because it's new, uh, with what what to do with this sort of monster that happened, that we just didn't see coming. In and one commonality maybe is that in the financial sector, you have the private arms, fraud and deception, and then you have the systemic arms. And, and excessive risk taking, yeah. excessive leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, systemic arms yeah. means excessive uh, leverage, financial crises, uh, and uh, inefficiencies. And then <coughs> you have in the tech sector, uh, there is a lot of discussion about privacy and private arms, and monopoly, and so on, but there is the questions of the systemic harm, like uh, Facebook messing around in, unintentionally with our democracy. So I, I would say another thing that's common, you know, there's, in the political sphere, there's always sort of words that have a certain meaning and, and are used a lot in the, in the lobbying and in the discussion. So in the case of finance, it's the word credit. Credit is this positive word in the English language. You know, credit, the end of the book, of, of a movie, you know, credit. So you say credit and it's like people melt away, you know, credit will suffer if you threaten me with that then the politicians get all scared, or they just need credit to some people that they like, or whatever. So if you get into politics, it's so politics of credit. In the internet, and in, in, in the technology, it's the word innovation. If you say that word, you know, then again, they, you know, they get scared of doing something that would harm innovation. Even though we also know that, you know, it's actually monopolies that, that harm innovation. But, you know, in the narrative, that, that's the threat that, that uh, that gets um, pointed out. So we have one minute before we go to the Q&A. So to, I, I'm curious to know, you talked about asymmetrics, uh, asymmetry between the consumers and the, uh, the company. So with a show of hands, I'd like to hear from the students here who thinks that she or he is uh, finance savvy. That you are just, you, you think you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, as much information and understanding of the financial products you are buying, as much as the people who are selling it to you. Who think he is financially or she is financially savvy? Okay. Now we are all users of the social networks. Who thinks that uh, she is uh, technology technologically savvy? So competition, if people don't think that they are savvy, and competition won't uh, weed out all their problems. The problem, right? is, the problem is combination of savviness and also power. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter how savvy you are. When you get that terms of service or privacy policy, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a really, uh, uh, you know, adhesive, you know, contract. It's a contract where you don't have, it's not a real consent. I mean, you know, you, you have no choice. So there's just a lot of situations where you could be very informed, but you can't stop, you're too powerless. And, that, and that's sort of where the problem comes. So there's sort of, partly it's information and, and, and understanding, and partly it's power and control. 
Okay, so before we go into the uh, Q&A, let me end with the following question. So this is all very interesting, but the problem is that most of the students that come to uh, the MBA uh, uh, want, to, you know, want to compete later in the, uh, uh, in the business world and want to get ahead. And you, we all know that in order to compete and get ahead in the business world, uh, you have to work for companies that are all the time in, engaged in aggressive lobbying because this is the best way in many industries to uh, uh, to compete. So what is your message for MBAs? And so you would think, you know, I don't have uh, much to discuss with MBAs, but I actually discovered in the last couple of years that uh, the MBA students actually want to talk about with the case. Uh, and my latest thinking about this is that, uh, is that in a business school, because we sort of take the world as given and our job is just to do private sector and all of that, we, um, we were educating in too narrow a way. And my, my view on that is just, it's not preachy or, you know, but it also doesn't think that the ethics courses that we teach right now are enough to really understand the context of what. So I think they distributed a, a piece from the alumni magazine of Stanford and GSB, uh, in which uh, there is this cartoon saying, uh, the, um, I just got it back with that cartoon from the student leaders of my initiatives, and I have student leaders, we call, uh, what does it say? Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I just want people to be aware. And so, and it's more like, uh, for the, inter in the internet course, I discussed with students, uh, you know, again, words that were, would have been foreign to me 15 years ago. I wouldn't even know how to say them in a classroom, you know, trust. How do you get trust, okay? Do you get trust through a contract? How do I know to trust you that you won't, you know, harm me later if I engage with you? through a contract, through a law, through my ethics, you know, how. So if we say, okay, I'm going on, on Facebook, I'm putting my money in the bank, how do you trust them with your data, with your money, uh, all of that? So the laws and the rules can be written in the private sector. They would be, you know, the community standards of Facebook. You know, something that Mark Zuckerberg decided, right, uh, basically. Uh, and then he'll have an enforcement on it. He'll bring content moderators and he'll you know, try to remove things and not remove all of that. Versus, and so I view now governments and corporations as sort of equal in some respect. In other words, governance problems in politics and governance problems in corporations are just sort of all intertwined. In the global world, corporations actually have more power than governments. So I want even MBA students to just understand their responsibility that comes from that. To go to the private sector, that the private sector actually ends up having as much or more power than governments. When you see cities compete for Amazon's you know, uh, headquarters or whatever, when you see the way that the, the you know, corporations play off governments in the local and in, even in the sovereign level, you begin to appreciate more you know, where you are in this sort of world economic system that we have. And I think that appreciation is the beginning of, of sort of more enlightened, a little bigger picture um, leadership that, uh, that we might have in the business sector and in the political spectrum. And of course, people move from one to the other. So just about time to go to the Q&A. So we have uh, Mike here, and we have a couple of people here. Uh, so thanks for your time today. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about policy prescriptions, specifically for the technology firms, I'm thinking Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Um, do, do the problems they cause warrant a policy solution? What do you think they should look like? Uh, I haven't, I try to be very careful what I say. When I am sure, I say it as loudly as I can. For the tech sector, I only have a few things that I can be or true, you know, people talk about breakups and things like that. I'm not sure what that even looks like. Um, and so, but I want to go to the roots of it. So if the root of it, uh, so certainly uh, the people who speak to true 
interoperability, that certainly is uh, a path. I mean, we know now that we can move phones because our number is in, in, uh, interoperable, and that was something that, that we didn't have in the cell phone industry. So sometimes you just need to force the data to kind of move to a competitor, including the insights. So, and it's not enough to say I can download. So that's all has to be debated. I also definitely think that some of the contracts, some of the terms are, are truly abusive. And, and basically, we don't have the time in the world, and I've presented to my students calculations about how long it would take us to read, but even if we're rationally not reading these terms of service and we're agreeing to all kinds of things, but there are dark patterns and other types of, of, uh, of uh, strategies that are really uh, trying to take advantage of people and weaknesses, and they just need to be uh, regulated at the, at the start, at the core. So you need certain you know, basic consumer protections. I want to say also about the two sectors, that in a lot of cases, people think we need entirely new, new rules in the book, and that's not true. We have a lot of rules that already apply. In the net, in the net, uh, in the internet area, for example, on the net neutrality, we have common carrier rules, and the right now is how to classify internet, uh, uh, you know, service providers, ISPs, uh, and, and and that's that's what's being eroded right now is 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 that definition. Common carrier is like a train, like a phone, you know, they have to transmit the stuff, and so we in some in consumer protection, that's FTC and, and and others that can do a lot more. Uh, so, uh, so we we can start by nibbling at that, right, uh, the low apples, what I would call, it. and certainly in finance. But you asked about the internet, and I, and I want to get out of finance. Yes, please. Oh, thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, I just had a question on how you think about the trade-offs between changing market structures or making these changes to the incentives of, of the players in the market. I mean, to the extent that. Oftentimes when we have, um, say, government policy changes, there's often a cost to it, um, I mean, to the extent that, say, in Europe you have you know, lending restrictions by banks and then somebody else, they still want to borrow money, so somebody finds a way to let them borrow money at a higher cost. So I guess how should we think about some of these trade-offs? Okay, so when you talk about there's a cost of regulation, again, I already alluded a little bit to private costs, social costs, so there's always sort of a compliance cost, and then you have to ask, okay, so what will happen? You know, they'll go to the shadow, they'll evade it this way or that way. So, you know, for example, you're saying lending restrictions. Uh, that's, uh, why a bank would make a loan and not another loan, it's all, it has politics as well as, as economics uh, uh, in it. Uh, in this country, you have uh, you know all these stories about payday lending or lending to you know taxes in taxes in New York or all these other uh, stories of, of predatory uh, lending. My my point there is once again you step back. I always step back to ask what's the root problem? Why would somebody borrow at three hundred percent interest or whatever? You know, so it goes to to basic poverty. It goes to basic social safety net. In other words, so it goes to inequality. So in other words, go back and peel from it. Uh, compliance costs, you know, it's a question of whether it's worth it or not. We have we have we have laws about, you know, speed limits and we enforce them. Some countries don't. So it's like you want to have a law against driving under the influence, you're gonna have to put the people to, you know, check people's breath uh, for alcohol, but we save lives, so that's when it's lives. You know, you got safety in other industries, you've got FDA and what we eat and what we drink. Uh, I think the abstract, the more abstract industries also, we can, we can decide what they, what's about right for, for regulation. I'm not particularly a regulation talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm one thing that I'm wondering about, dear, Sorry? Just the oh, wait, so, uh, we are recording. so there is a branch of economics that has been arguing for years that we should be, you know, thinking about power as being a central part of economics, and they're kind of like outside the mainstream. And so I'm sort of wondering, given some of the revelations you've had, is whether you've sort of thought about connecting more with that and to what extent the mainstream How do you should. call that political economy or? Well, there is, I mean, there's some economics. of them are the, the I, I don't know the name, some of them have called them critical perspectives, others would say 
that it's heterodox economics, and then, you know, and but they sort of think that power is like at the center of all of this. And listening to you, I kind of got a similar message. I never exactly knew what to do with these, but, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I certainly, uh, there are pieces of parts of economics, definitely political economy, but not, uh, political economy is one, and then sort of the view that institutions matter, uh, I certainly will subscribe for. So there's a book, for example, by Ajimuglo and, uh, and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, and it's all about extractive versus inclusive institutions and, you know, why certain uh, needs. So, and, and I, I also dare to say the word corruption. So corruption is being abuse of power is sort of where I think a lot of problems can be bundled under, and that can happen again in private sector and in the government. So there can be a capture, which is sort of, uh, you know, more in the government capture, political capture, or, or, or media capture, or other capture like that, or it can be uh, abuse of power in, in, in every domain of the private of the private sector if they, if they can get away with So I, I don't know heterodox, I mean, you know, some of them, some like economists that go to the fringes are weird for me, and I'm still pretty traditional, so it's more like, you know, the economic forces that I see are just much broader than I used to think. I just, my theory was based on a lot of assumptions that I now know are wrong. Yeah. I believe, or well, if I'm wrong, that actually until 80 or 90 years ago, there was no such thing as a discipline called economics. It used to be called political economy, and only later it was renamed to economics because economists were envious of the people from the science. Uh, they wanted to be real scientists, so they dropped political. So what's interesting about that is just I've become is, uh, you know critical of economics, and I now go around saying it's a dismal science. Uh, and uh, but economics is the you know queen of social sciences. I wrote a piece that is referred to in this in this handout of corporate governance for economists, Journal of Economic Perspectives. Luigi had another piece there. Both of us were basically on political economy. He was talking about, about political power and monopoly power, market power, and I was talking about fraud, deception, and endangerment as sort of you know the way what can happen if the politics fails to to stop it. But what I want to say is uh, there was a a statement by an economist uh, from the 70s that I was uh, told to take out of my statement, my article by editors, uh, thought maybe too offensive to economists, I had to be gentle, uh, with them saying uh, every economic transaction is a solved political problem. Uh, economics has gained the status of the queen of social sciences by taking solved political problems as their subject of study. So, uh, so there's something in that, we just assume. And a colleague of mine wrote a paper about the misuse of theory in economics in which he started with a joke about the can opener, right? About the, the, chemist, the chemist and the physicist and the economist stuck in an island and they have a can uh, and they discuss how to open it and the chemist is wanting to heat it and the physicist is thinking about how to break through and the economists say, uh, let's assume a can opener. So, uh, <laughs> so the economist just makes assumption, moves on to write the fancy uh, uh, mathematical results that follow from the assumptions, and they live happily in that space of assumptions. So, fantastic! I think this is the right time to end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, so my new website, in which I was told I had to have a visual, and the visual just shows a few people, and the book is like, and it shows a few people just in their back, just passing things behind their back. Mm -hmm. <laughs>